First, let me say a few words about this uh, 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 distinguished speak service. In July 2009, we received about one million uh, Singapore dollars uh, donation from Mr. Tay Lian Wei, uh, who is the CEO and the managing director of the Science Watch. Uh, the purpose for his donation is to run uh, 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 lecture series and the seminars in, not in honor of uh, his late mother, uh, Hyung Siu Ching, and that's why we have this. And uh, today we are very honored and privileged to have uh, Professor Xu White uh, here to talk about a very important and uh, also very timely issue that is, like I said, that uh, how the Asians uh, can maintain in peace, stay in stability uh, while we have uh, United States and China try to rebalance each other. Uh, this is a very important issue because we know that as a, a Pacific power, United States of America has a huge interests, vital interests in the region. And also we know that President Obama obviously is determined to protect American interests while try to promote peace, stability, and prosperity in the region, which are very, very important to the United States. And uh, you know, can call it return to Asia, which I don't think is appropriate words. Actually, the good words is what uh, our president, our President Obama, is doing right now: rebalancing. But rebalancing is not containment. Rebalancing is not get to China, not at all. Rebalancing is try to create a situation in which United States, as a leader of the world and a rising China, can work with each other so that they can work out something together. I don't know what something is yet. <laughs> uh, 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 that to promote peace, stability, and prosperity in this region, which is good for everyone. But the challenge, of course, for regional countries, so countries in this region, Asian countries in Australia, in Asian Pacific, is that number one, how they are going to do on their own, for their own interests, to respond to a rising China, which tend to be more and more assertive at least in the past few years, and the United States who try to figure out what is the best strategy to deal with the rest in China on the one hand and to protect American's vital interests on the other hand. Of course, the worst situation for every one of us is that all this kind of effort leads to a confrontation, which is quite unlikely in my view. However, there will be another difficult situation, that is the countries in this region are forced to take sides which, of course, is not what the United States of America want, in my view, and I don't think that works for China, too. But to avoid that situation, first and foremost, countries like Australia, Singapore, and else will try to figure out what is their interests, what is their ground that they have to hold in their approach towards the United States and China, how they can make a contribution to regional peace and stability and prosperity, and from their point of view. And today, again, we are very honored to have Professor White here to give us a presentation and lecture on his recent studies on this very important issue. Please join me to welcome Professor White. Uh, well, Professor Wang, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to Yoshin for the in original initiative to uh, to, to get me here and to Jasmine for making it all happen and thanks to you all for coming along and so nice to see so many old friends and in some cases old colleagues um, here in the room. Um, it's a very big topic, as you've said, and a very important one. In a sense, we're talking about nothing less than the future of Asia. Uh, the upside, of course, is that we have seen and hope to continue to see remarkable economic growth across the region and everything that follows from that social progress, political progress, and so on. The downside is the rise of strategic rivalry, which comes with economic growth. I think that's a risk we have to take very seriously. Uh, our, our challenge is to try and make continued economic growth and the shift in relative economic weight that flows from that compatible with peace and stability. I, I think we can do that, 
but I think we're going to have to do things differently from the way we're doing, it, doing them at the moment if we're to succeed. Now, I want to start by just spelling out two simple propositions. In a sense, they're almost too simple to be worth spelling out to an audience as sophisticated as this. But because they're so important and because they're a bit unfamiliar to us because of our own experience, the experience of th this, I shouldn't say this generation, these generations, um, uh, I think it's just worth spending a second on them. The first of these simple propositions is the link between wealth, power, relationships and order. That is that wealth in the end is power. The relationship between wealth and power is very complicated. And the way in which wealth translates into power varies in lots of different ways, but in the end, rich states are strong. And uh, as that, that, amongst other things, that means that as wealth shifts, as relative wealth shifts, power shifts. Second point is that power shapes relationships between states in very fundamental ways. So as power relationships change, so do underlying relationships. Power relativities change, so do relationships. And the third point is that order depends on the relationships particularly between the, world, between the stronger states in the region. And order seems like an abstract concept, but I, by, by it I mean something very concrete. It's the way in which states get on with one another. We take order in Asia to some extent for granted because we have lived through the best 40 years, the most stable 40 years in Asia's history an era in which there's been a remarkably strong and robust order. But if we compare our experience of the last 40 years, since 1972, since Nixon went to China, with the years from, shall we say, the 1950s and 1960s, or even worse, the 1930s and the 1940s, we can see just how remarkable this last 40 years has been. And what made it remarkable is the fact that throughout that period, the strongest states in Asia United States, China and Japan in particular, have got on remarkably well. Now, my basic hypothesis is that um, if we can't maintain that kind of order, some kind of order, economic growth and social progress is going to be very difficult to maintain. And that little cascade I've just described means that when wealth shifts, power shifts. When power shifts, relationships change. When relationships change, the order has to change, the underlying order. And that process is risky for all of us. The second simple proposition is that we're now in the middle of the biggest shift in relative wealth and power in 200 years, and perhaps the biggest shift in relative wealth and power in history. It's very hard to keep this in perspective because it, it forms so much of our day-to-day -day lives but we are living through a really remarkable period and managing the tensions that flow from that immense shift in wealth and therefore in power and therefore in relationships and therefore in the foundations of order is the challenge that we face in Asia at the moment. Now, of course, that's not just about China. There's a huge story about India and there's a huge story about Indonesia but my argument would be that China's rise, the shift in, in relative wealth, in particular between the US and China, is the most urgent and at least at the moment the largest of the challenges we face and should remain that way for the next few decades at least. And it's worth bearing in mind that the challenge that's posed to the regional order by China's growing wealth and therefore growing power is not something we can speculate as a future possibility. It's, it's happening now, it's already there. China is already close to the United States in, in, in GDP and PPP terms. By the middle of the century, it could have a GDP which is half as big again or even double America's in PPP terms. This is, at least to someone of my generation, <coughs> almost unimaginable. But, but that is where the, today's trends could take us and we'd be very unwise to assume that that won't happen. Moreover, China already seeks to redefine its relationship with the United States on the basis of its changing relative wealth and power. And in doing so, of course, it seeks to redefine the regional order. We don't know what it wants. I'm not quite sure that China knows what it wants. 
but we can guess what it hopes for. I think it hopes for leadership. And we can be pretty sure what it won't settle for. That is, we can pre be pretty sure that as China's power grows to approach America's, at least in economic terms, it will not settle for the status quo. Because right at the heart of that status quo, right at the heart of that very stable Asian order, which has really empowered the Asian century and all of, the, the, all of that phrase encompasses, right at the heart of that is the idea of US primacy, uncontested by the other great powers, US leadership, if you like, and what's implied by that, of course, is Chinese subordination to the United States. That's not something that we, the rest of us in the region, certainly that we in Australia, focus on very much. But that sense of subordination to the United States is right at the heart of the Asian order, right at the heart of China's predicament at the moment. And I think the chances of China continuing to accept that as the foundation for its relationship with the United States and the foundation of the Asian order for very long into the future is very low indeed. Now, that's not to say that I think we should want China to challenge the order that we have in Asia at the moment. I personally think, from the point of view of Australia, I would say, from the point of view of Singapore, I would say, that, that the order uh, framed by US primacy has been extremely good for us, and if it could last forever, that would be a great outcome. But that's no longer a possibility in a world in which China is actively contesting US leadership. It's no longer uncontested primacy. So it's no good harking back to that. We have to now ask ourselves, well, what happens next? And although we might regret China's challenge to American primacy, I don't think we can necessarily describe it as at least, by definition, illegitimate. There's nothing inherently illegitimate in a country as its power growing, seeking through that power to play a bigger role in the international order. There can be something illegitimate about precisely what it chooses to do with that power, but there's nothing inherently illegitimate about it choosing to, to exercise more power in the international order. And after all, I mean, that's what the Europeans did uh, as their power grew with the Industrial Revolution. That Chinese challenge to the US-led order in Asia is, I think, the biggest challenge to peace and stability in Asia since 1941. Uh, that's a big and slightly scary claim but I think it's a very defensible one. So what I want to talk about is how America responds to that. And I'm not going to focus on the US response just because I think that's the only issue that matters. I think there's a terribly critical question about how China responds to the fact that it and the United States, uh, it, it, to the fact of its challenge to the US power, how it conducts that challenge, what it's going to be satisfied for. There's a great question about China. But I want to focus on the United States because I think you know, the United States response and the choices the United States face have received less attention than they should have. In particular, I think they've received both less attention in the United States and less attention elsewhere in Asia, outside China, than they should have. And, and I do think, although they're only part of the question, they're an absolutely critical part of the question. So let's get a few things clear about the United States. The first is, there's no part of the argument I want to present to you that I believe the United States is in decline. I think the United States remains a remarkably strong and resilient and capable state with immense capacities. And it will certainly, bar some unforeseen catastrophe, have the strength to play a major role in Asia for the remainder of this century if it chooses to do so. But having said that, having said the United States is not in decline, it's not to say that relative power is not shifting very fast. That is, it faces in China a country uh, uh, which approaches it more closely in terms of GDP and for, in some respects in other measures of power than any country has done uh, for, and that it's, it therefore does face a very sharp change in its relative power position in the world. And I do think the United States is in what one might call a state of semi-denial about that. Obviously, an immensely sophisticated country with an immensely sophisticated political process, there is clear recognition of the way in which China's growing wealth is, is affecting America's relative position 
but it's very hard to see that reflected in detail in US political discourse, or for that matter, in many US policy processes. Now, as I say, I think there is absolutely no reason in terms of the actual power available to the United States why should not continue to play an, ap an absolutely central role in Asia for as far ahead as we can bother to look. But there is a very big question about the nature of that role, the kind of role that the United States is going to be equipped to play, is going to be strong enough to play, and the kind of role that is going to be in America's interests to play, and the kind of role that is going to be in our interests that America plays. And that's the issue I really want to get into. And the first point to make about it is that America has choices about that. And that point's worth making because a lot of people in the US discussion, I think in particular, tend to assume that America doesn't have choices. Although very few people would agree with him just, you know, absolutely, the kind of ideas that John Mearsheimer has, has advanced, for example, in his book, like, his book, his works like The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, the idea that when a rising power meets an established power, they are sort of predestined to conflict. I think is simply wrong. There is no reason why the United States and China should not live in peace. There's no reason why the United States doesn't have choices to make about the kind of future relationship it has with China, just as there's no reason why China doesn't have choices to make about the kind of relationship it has with the United States. So there are choices to make. And as the United States looks at those choices, it seems to me that there are three options. Now, this is going to seem a bit artificial, but I actually think these three options do, between them, absorb the whole of the decision space available to the United States. I don't think there's much else it can do one way or other than do one of these three things. The first is, in the face of China's challenge to the US-led order in Asia, the United States could withdraw. That is, in a sense, concede everything to China. The second is that it could concede something to China and share power in Asia, remain a strong player but concede something to China. And the third is it can concede nothing to China and resist the Chinese challenge to American primacy and try to preserve the status quo. Let me just say a word about each one of those options. The first one, withdrawal, most people dismiss out of hand. I, I think that's a mistake. It's not, as I've said before, because I think China, America won't have the capacity to stay engaged in Asia. I'm sure it will have the, the power to do that in some form. But it is that, in, in the end, important though Asia is to the United States, there are limits to America's stake. And I think one can argue, I've constructed an argument in the book I've published, that the United States could in fact conclude that its interests are best served by withdrawal. Uh, I don't think you can make an argument that that serves Asia's interests best. I think from, 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 from our point of view, the rest of Asia rather than China, I think it's very hard to imagine a stable and peaceful Asia in which the United States doesn't play a strong role. But from America's point of view, I think one can construct an argument in which it might look the least bad possible out option. Particularly as the decades passed, and this is not just a question for this year or next year, but for further out, I think I don't think anyone on this side of the Pacific should simply take it for granted the United States will be engaged in Asia in some form or other, particularly when one thinks about what the alternatives look like. The second option, the option of sharing power, conceding something to China but not everything, is usually dis dismissed out of hand. And I think particularly in any real sense, there is part of the US discourse which says that we are prepared to share power with China. I personally think that that reflects no genuine willingness to reshape the fundamental way the order works. No genuine willingness to really concede a much bigger role to China than it's had in the past. So the third option is the option of resisting, conceding nothing, attempting to maintain the status quo of, a, of an order based on US primacy as the, 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 uh, the, the, the fundamental rationale for America's role in Asia. This is, in a sense, the default option in the sense that it's always a strong default to status quo and it's a lot of psychological and political and even bureaucratic inertia behind sticking with that option. Now, although it's a complex question and one has to look to a certain extent 
past the day-to-day -day diplomacy and look at, so to speak, the deeper dynamics of the situation. I would argue that US policy today is clearly in the third category. It is clearly it's concede nothing and resist the Chinese challenge to American primacy in favour of maintaining the status quo, which has worked so well for the last 40 years. I should say that US policy is rhetorically very complicated. There's a lot of words thrown at it. Engagement, shaping, hedging, rebalancing. But I think if you look below that complex rhetoric at the reality, it seems to me quite clear that the principal aim of American policy in Asia today is to preserve US leadership and the status quo that it supported. It's not that there aren't good reasons for that policy, because as I've said, the status quo has been very good for us. And of course, it's not that it's not psychologically, if I can put it this way, politically understandable. Obviously, stepping back from the status quo is immensely difficult from a policy point of view and immensely difficult politically. Um, and I think that the best way to interpret what we've seen in US policy, particularly over the last few years, over the years of the first Obama administration, very strongly confirms the centrality of preserving the status quo and therefore resisting any accommodation with China as the rationale of US policy. That's really what the pivot is all about. I do take the pivot very seriously. I take the initial statement of the pivot more seriously than the than the attempts to rebalance the language of the pivot uh, that came uh, after its initial formulation. I do see it as a major realignment of US strategic priorities. I think what Barack Obama discovered essentially in 2009 was that contrary to what people in the United States had believed for at least uh, or almost a decade before that, the central challenge to America's position in the world was not coming from the Middle East, it was coming from China and that the central question for America was how it responded to that. And uh, I think the speech, in particular the speech that uh, President Obama gave in Canberra a year ago yesterday, if I've got my dates right, um, uh, where he, to my mind, very strongly committed the United States to maintaining the, the status quo, to exercising all the elements of American power to do that and to build a diplomatic and military coalition to support that position, to resist the Chinese challenge, to maintain the status quo. That seemed to me to be a very clear demonstration of that underlying objective. And it's worth making the point that the fact that t today um, President Obama so early in his second administration with such horrendous domestic problems looming on the fiscal front is uh, willing to spend as much time in Asia Take this, I think, symbolically very interesting trip to Southeast Asia that he's taking is a very strong reaffirmation of how central that is to his strategic agenda. Now, I would argue that this is containment. Of course, the US government says it's not. Lots of very distinguished US scholars say it's not. But let me try this little test on you. This is a test I try on my American friends. Let's ask a hypothetical question. If China was challenging the US-led order in Asia and was determined to grab for itself a substantially bigger role of regional leadership, would the US respond by resisting it? And I find that when one asks that question, Americans say, yes, of course we would. So then I say, so it's only not containment as long as China's not challenging. Yeah, that's right. But China is challenging. Otherwise, why, why the pivot? What's the pivot for if the United States is not facing a really central challenge to its authority in Asia? So if the policy makes any sense at all, it is containment. Now, I can know why the American political system, and for that matter, the broader system, doesn't want to use that word, because it carries all sorts of very complex connotations suggests there is a problem. But I, don't, I, think, I think we need to see things as they are. Now, of course, just because it's containment doesn't mean it's not going to work. In one very famous occasion, most of recent history, containment did work. And the world's a better place for it. So the question is, will it work in this case? 
Can the United States effectively respond to China's challenge by attempting to resist any significant compromise with China's ambitions for a greater role in, Asia, in the Asian order and preserve the status quo of US primacy? And this boils down to a very simple question. It's a question of power and will, as such competitions always are. Is China's power and China's will to expand its role significantly going to be bigger than America's power and America's will to preserve the status quo? Well, China's not as powerful as America in some respects. But I would argue that in Asia, where it counts, where this competition is going to unfold, the Chinese position is stronger than it looks. I would say that's particularly true on the military front. I won't get into this now. But I do think that people misunderstand the military balance between the US and China if they just look up the lists of stuff and see how much each has got. What matters is not what you've got, but what you can do with it, where it counts, when it counts. And I think there is a very significant asymmetrical advantage to China on the military front. Likewise, diplomatically, people often say quite correctly that America has a vast network of friends and allies in Asia which are an immense asset to America in such a strategy in relation to China. And that China has none, or virtually none. And I think that's true. But I do think we have to ask very carefully to what extent are America's friends and allies in Asia assets or liabilities? Again, it's a long subject. I won't give the argument here. But I think we have to be very careful in assuming that for America today in managing its relationship with China, an alliance with the Philippines or an alliance with Japan or even an alliance with Australia is much of an asset. If the US did find itself at war with China over the Senkakus, Japan would be there, but who else would be? I'm here, I'm here to tell you Australia wouldn't be. If the US does find itself at war with China over Taiwan, who would be there to help it? Which of this galaxy of friends and allies? I, I'm gonna make a guess, nobody would. None of us would be there. And I'm not sure we'd be wrong not to be there. But, but so, so what's this great asset? So, I don't think we should assume, I, I think, I'll put it a different way, I think, I think China is strong enough to pose the United States a very substantial challenge. And it's worth getting back to the economic fundamentals. China is already substantially stronger in economic terms relative to the United States than the Soviet Union ever was during the Cold War. It's a very powerful country indeed. And the second is the point about China's will. How much does China want this? How much of its, how much cost and risk is it prepared to run? And I would, versus how much, how much is America committed to this? America is very committed, I'm sure, to its interests in Asia. But I wouldn't assume that Asia and its role in it means more to the United States than it does to China. I think that would be a very serious miscalculation indeed. So I think there's a pretty fair chance the United States is not going to win this one. What's more, I think the strategy of containment, if I can continue to call it that um, contentiously, carries huge costs and risks to both sides, but including to America. Economically, of course, the immense risk that it poses to the absolutely fundamental economic relationship between the two countries. And strategically, there's the costs of rivalry, which itself could, I think, be very great, or already a very significant factor in the way American thinks about, for example, its future defence requirements. But also, and more significantly, the cost is just not just a rivalry, but a war. This is a very important part of my thinking about all of this. I do think the risk of war between the United States and China is something we have to take very seriously. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't even think it's very highly likely. But I think its, it's, it's likelihood is high enough for us to take it very seriously indeed, particularly when we pay attention to the consequences of it if it occurs. And it's not that unlikely. It's not very hard to build a scenario in which some silly incident in the Senkakus produces a situation in which leaders neither in Washington nor Beijing find any better thing to do than to keep escalating. And it is worth bearing in mind that these are both nuclear states with the capacity to target one another's homelands. And for reasons, again, which I won't go into in detail, I think the threshold for nuclear escalation in a US-China conflict 
is both lower and less clear than most people understand, which means the risk of nuclear escalation is real. That is something, the risk of war between the two, the risk that such a war could escalate into a major conflict, the risk that that could escalate to a nuclear conflict is a very significant factor which must be taken into account when we weigh the costs and risks of different options. Having said all that, which suggests that containment's not a great strategy, but whether it's still the best strategy depends on the alternatives. So what is the alternative? Well, I've said that I think withdrawal's a really bad option. So there's the third for choice. That's, that's sharing power. Most people doubt that this option exists because most people approaching the question about Asia's future tend to presuppose that there are only two options available. Either America dominates or China does. And I think one of the things that drives American thinking, and to a certain extent thinking in Asia, towards support for America's maintaining primacy is the thought that the only alternative to that is Chinese primacy. I think that's clearly wrong. There clearly is a possibility for Asia's future order in which the United States steps back from leadership but doesn't step back from Asia and in which China steps up to leadership but doesn't take over the region itself, doesn't establish hegemony itself. A future for Asia in which the United States power in Asia is big enough and broadly based enough to balance and limit the way China uses its power, but which provides enough space for China to play a significantly qualitatively different role in Asia than the, than the role it's played before. Essentially, that is a vision of Asia's strategic future in which these two countries function as equals. And I don't want to try and pretend that I think that's a terrific outcome. When you talk about words like equality and balance and sharing, it sounds nice. And it's tempting to think that the reason why I argue for this as a vision for Asia's future is because it's got a nice sound to it. I, that's not my approach at all. I like the status quo. I like an imbalance of power in America's favour. It's been very good for Australia. It's been very good for the rest of us. I just don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to succeed. I think it's going to drive Asia towards very serious escalation. And so it's not through any sort of ideological instinct towards justice, but a very high premium for order, which makes me think that this might be a better option. Of course, it would be very different from the status quo. And in some ways, not as good. But it's better than the alternatives. It's also, of course, not clear that China will accept it. It's not clear that China's ambitions are sufficiently modest that it will be willing to share power with, with Asia, in Asia with the United States. And a very big part of my analysis, which again I won't go into here, is how we can persuade China of that. I think the core to that is, is, is China recognising that for all its future power, it won't be strong enough to dominate Asia by itself. Not just because of the, the United States is likely to be there as a significant player, but so will India and Japan, and perhaps in future Indonesia, and, uh, and so on. This is a region full of strong states, and China will find it very hard to dominate. So, uh, if China could be persuaded of this, then I think there's a significant prospect that the US and China could do a deal, implicit or explicit, in which the US stays engaged in Asia to balance China, but not to dominate it. But it's not quite as easy as that. Because in order to make that work, I think the other great powers in the region have to play, have to be part of that deal. That means that at least at the moment, Japan and soon India would have to be part of that. So it's not just a bilateral deal, it's quadrilateral at least, and perhaps in future Indonesia. There is a model for an international order that functions like that, with a multiple group of great powers kind of self-consciously managing regional affairs between them. It was the model uh, which was implemented in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the model that kept Europe reasonably peaceful and stable throughout the 19th century. That's the century in which Europe took over the world. It was the European century. 
it's a very complex model to implement. Um, but it does at least suggest to us that that's not something we could, that that's something that might be, might be made to work. So, because it's not clear the United States will accept this either. That phrase, treat China as an equal, I've, I've, um, I've road tested it on lots of Americans. It doesn't sell well, let me tell you. It's contrary to all of America's traditions of foreign policy. But of course, so it has to be. Because China is a completely different kind of power from any of the United States has faced before. Completely different is a big claim, isn't it? But this gets back to the centrality of the economics. As it thinks about its future relationship with China, the United States has to, has to recognise that it's dealing with a country which within the time frames that are relevant to America's current policy choices has a good chance of having an economy that's half as big as America's again. American foreign policy has literally never dealt with such a power. So why should we be surprised that it has to encompass new categories? American foreign policy can't encompass treating a country with an economy half as big as it's again as an equal, then there's a problem. And it's worth asking the question, what does the future hold for America as a rival of China? What kind of future are Americans making for themselves if they choose to define their place in the world in rivalry with this immensely powerful state? So it's a big choice for America. And that's the point of my deliberately provocative title, keeping the peace or courting conflict. Because I do believe that US policy today contributes the probability of escalating strategic rivalry with China and works against the chance of a long-term peaceful modus vivendi between them, which I think is, at least theoretically, within reach. Not to say, of course, that the US doesn't have a vital role to play in the Asian order, but it's very different from the role it's known in the past, and it's going the wrong way now to move to that new role. And there's not much time left. The longer the trend towards escalating rivalry, which I think is now already a well-established, continues, the harder it will be to step back and move towards an accommodation. Let me finish just by very quickly saying what that means for the rest of us. Countries like Australia and Singapore, and indeed I would say all the countries in Asia, other than the US and China themselves, all I think clearly want the same things. None of us want to live under China's shadow. And we all recognise that the, United, the US role in Asia, a strong US role in Asia, is the best way to prevent that happening. So we all want the United States to stay engaged. On the other hand, none of us want to have to make a choice between the US and China. And none of us want to live with the consequences of US-China strategic competition. None of us want to live with the consequences of the intense globalisation, the intense regional integration which US-China uh, amity has allowed being pulled apart. None of us want to live with the consequences of the US and China strategically dividing the region up between them. None of us want to live with the consequences of US-China conflict, which would be, I think, most unimaginably devastating. So we all want the US to stay engaged in Asia, but we all want the United States to stay engaged in Asia in a way which doesn't drive escalating strategic rivalry with China, if that's at all possible. And in the end, that means we all want the United States to stay engaged in Asia in a form that China is willing to live with. And China, if you agree with my basic hypothesis that China won't accept the status quo, that means we all want the United States to stay engaged in Asia in some way, in some form which is different than I would say the present trend of US policy is. It's not a matter of choosing now between the US and China. That's not my argument at all. It's a matter for the rest of us of deciding whether there's anything we can do to avoid or help make less likely the rise in rivalry between the US and China, which would in future force us to make that choice that none of us want to make. We want to preserve or at least build an order in Asia in which that choice doesn't have to be made. That is, I think, a huge challenge for our diplomacy. It's certainly a huge challenge for Australia's diplomacy. We have, you could say, for 230 years, always seen our role in the world and our role in Asia as being mediated by the domination of the region by an Anglo-Saxon maritime power, first Britain and America. 
for the first time in our history, we're asking ourselves, how do we shape our security in an Asia which is no longer dominated by our Anglo-Saxon great and powerful friends, like America? We have to have some very fresh thinking about these issues too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pro, uh, Professor White. That is a very profound and also deep, of course, provocative presentation. <laughs> the fundamental question is that China's rise, well, actually China's rise has already, in my view, broken status quo. And uh, just about 10 years ago, every country in this region only needs to have plan A because Americans' choice is where we align our interests. But now everyone in the region has to have plan B. Uh, everybody is hedging. So we have a phenomena can be, in my view, summarized by two words, integration and uncertainty. Integration is that the region is irrevocably integrated into one, and this integration is not driven by any policies, but by driven by market forces, which is good. But uncertainty, of course, you can see that have two centers, China Center, economic dynamics, and the Americans still trying to hold the center in terms of security and political alignment. And, uh, and worst of all, both China and United States are in the transition period. We don't know what China will be 10 years from now. We don't really know what United States is going to be 10 years from now. And this is the kind of situation that is really challenging. That's an understatement. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we have uh, heard from Professor, Professor White. I think that is very enlightening. And now the floor is open uh, for questions. And uh, please identify yourself, identify yourself briefly and before you ask the questions. And you can stand behind the mic over there. OK, Ruben. Thank you, Professor White. My name is Ruben Hintz. I'm a PhD student here at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Um, so if the U.S. were to try out this idea of ceding some leadership to a rising China, do you see a sector or even a specific organization which could serve as a, a prototype to try this out? Um, look, very, a very good question. Um, two points. Uh, the, the first is uh, I don't think the kind of relationship that I think the U.S. and China and remember I said these other great powers as well, has to build, is necessarily one that has to be reflected in an institution. Um, so it doesn't end up looking like, you know, the UN Security Council, for example. I mean, the, the permanent members of the UN Security Council are an attempt to build a concert, was an attempt to build a concert of the world's great powers at the time, uh, to function in exactly this kind of way. I, I, I don't think it's necessary that it functions in that way. And again, you know, I, I'm extremely cautious of using European strategic uh, um, analogies uh, on, on Asian strategic questions, but the reason I do is that I think the 19th century European order is the only example we have of a, of a durably stable um, set of um, uh, understandings between a complex system of great powers of the sort that I think we're heading into in Asia. And what was striking about that is that the institution that was constructed at the Congress of Vienna broke down quite quickly, sort of habits of regular conferences and all the rest of it. But the underlying understanding that nobody, none of the great powers uh, would do things which violated the status of a great power of the others proved remarkably durable. And durable in the face of some very severe shocks like the rise of Germany, for example. Now, of course, it did all end badly. Um, and people sometimes say, well, what's so great about the concept of Europe? It led to 1914. Yes, but there was a fabulous century in between. Well, fabulous for most people. Fabulous for Europeans. Um, and I think, um, so I don't, I don't I, my, my model is more that the, the group, a set of understandings has to be reached between these countries rather than it has to be institutionalised in any particular way. The second point is that I don't necessarily think that, that, that um, the, that the reaching of that agreement is going to happen within an institution. There's, there's, two, there's two processes here. The first is the question of how you actually build the agreement. The second is how, once the agreement's built, how the system runs. And it's a little bit like the relationship between a constitutional convention that writes a constitution 
and then the parliament that actually governs the country or the, you know, the, the, the actual arrangements that govern the country. Um, I do think there will be a continuing need for a reg regional institutions, which might not look very different from the regional institutions we have, to manage the day by day, month by month, year by year business of the region. A lot of stuff to be done. And actually, I don't think our ins regional institutions at the moment are too bad at doing that. Um, they'll be different under my model for what I think would be a better outcome for Asia than the one we're heading into. Um, but, they, but they would still function in, in roughly the same way. Um, but I don't think those institutions are going to be any use in building that order. Because in order to build that order, all of those great powers are going to have to give a great deal away. And I think it's a fundamental law, not just of international relations, but of human psychology, that the tougher the bargaining, the fewer people you want in the room. Nobody wants to negotiate their next pay rise with all their colleagues in the room with them. They just want to be alone with the boss. So the US and China, and eventually I think Japan and India, are going to have to have very private conversations about this. The big groups sort of meeting that's now taking place, they become occasions to display rather than to resolve differences. Um, so I think there'll be a place for institutions, but the institutions won't help to constitute uh, this order. It will, they'll, they'll, they'll just help to do the business once the order is constituted. Hi, Hugh. Um, as you know, we agree on many things, and there's yeah. you know, a little bit more than the sliver of daylight between us on many of these issues. Um, and I stole the idea of a concert from you. I should acknowledge this uh, to well, everybody. <laughs> I, what troubled me slightly in your book, as well as in your presentation, though, was uh, where we diverge, I think, is on what we think the region will find acceptable and what countries in the region, what roles countries in the regions region would play in the route to a concert. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a bit more about this. And I'll just say briefly what my take on this is. I think it pulls in two ways. I think we see American hegemony, and I use that word consideredly, in Asia because there's a great deal of complicity with American yes. preponderance in yes. the region. Yeah. And I agree with you that containment is not a viable strategy in a, in a situation now where we have one integrated global order. It's not a situation where you can have isolation as well as containment, which is what we had in the Cold War. But in that case, then the real interesting question is why do we have so much regional support for something like the pivot? Right? Um, a pivot is, the pivot is not something that the Obama administration or Hillary Clinton imposed on the region. It's something which has been achieved um, with significant support from key American allies and non-official allies like Singapore as well. So there's a great deal of sort of de facto reliance and, and you know, um, complicity with American strength in the region. Now that I think is going to halt, slow down, pose frictions for some idea of joint power between the US and China by itself. The other example, right, is this notion of concert that involves more than one, more than these two great yes, powers within yes, the region. Yes. Kevin Rudd encountered this in his idea of the Asia-Pacific community. Um, the one big obstacle is ASEAN, obviously. We have a very odd system in East Asia. We've got China, Japan, and the Koreas in Northeast Asia. Then we've got ASEAN in Southeast Asia, which thinks it is a great power and which, you know, shouts for a seat at the table. Once you admit ASEAN, you, you're dealing with 15 people, or, you know, 15 actors immediately. So we have this problem of a region that, oddly enough, is much less hierarchical than it would seem. There are far fewer players um, than it would seem. It, it seems incredibly difficult to, to take Indonesia out of the ASEAN equation. Um, so. How, you know, how, how are these things going to actually affect the possibility of moving towards a concert that involves more than the US and China? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Uh, since you mentioned India, I just thought I'd use India to illustrate how already uh, the balance may have shifted uh, very decisively in China's favor. Uh, I mean, it was only five years ago or six years ago that uh, uh, India and the United States signed the big nuclear deal and it looked like they were on their way to a very substantial partnership. But in fact, if you look at what's happened since then, uh, India has gone the other way, uh, to be honest. Um, the nuclear deal is in trouble, and all its statements, 
are about how it, it will not choose between the United States and China. Uh, and if you look at its uh, uh, economic engagement with China, that's one of the factors there. But I think very fundamentally, India has done at least a back of the envelope calculation that China is going to be so huge uh, that uh, really it's the beginning of the end of the American presence uh, in Asia. Uh, that there's a, in fact, they're far less optimistic than you are, which is that it's already pretty much game, yes. set, and match. Uh, because the one country in Asia, apart from Japan, that you think would never concede Chinese primacy would have been India, yes. given its own size, uh, sort of self-image, yes. and yes. the border conflict and all of that. Yes. But it seems to me that India has bent at the knee. It has understood very clearly that it's got absolutely no chance on its own of matching China, that the United States will not be there to uh, help it or any other country in a, in a fundamental quarrel, and that the pivot, uh, in fact, is the sh one of the surest signs that American power is f fading. I mean, 1,500 Marines in Australia, uh, that's a pivot. Uh, that looks ridiculous, almost. Um, and so it seems to me that, um, and just to push on from there, uh, uh, do you think, in fact, the problem is e not even more serious for America, which is that its own fundamental backyard will come under challenge from China, which is Latin America, parts of Europe, uh, and Africa. So that much more than trying to balance or come to an agreement with China and Europe, it better hasten back and start getting oh, a, a, its internal house in order and uh, you know, watch its own backside in, in Latin America and, and uh, neighborhoods much closer uh, to home. So you, let's go just to Yes, the, thank, thank you. Well, there too. Quite Great questions from two uh, valued uh, colleagues. E e Evelyn, there's a, there's a volume, in your, volume in your question. Let me give you the quick version. Um, the, the question of whether the region will find my concert model of just the great powers for, say, acceptable and what role they, role they will play in, in complementing it. And the related question you made about Asia being so unhierarchical, and ASEAN having this vision of itself as a kind of a collective great power in its own right, um, are closely connected. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to risk saying, you know, being characteristically Australian here and being a little blunt. Um, I, I think uh, I think ASEAN has been immensely successful in managing the relationships between its member states and that is a major achievement. But I think it's only been able to function in an era in which the great powers in Asia have been, have been choosing not to compete. Because one thing that history does seem to show is that when great powers compete, their capacity to peel small and middle powers away from one another, or rather the capacity of small and middle powers to hold together when great powers are trying to pull them apart, is pretty low. And it seems to me that one of the reasons why ASEAN has succeeded so well, and I'm saying this, I don't want to minimise the, the diplomatic achievements of the ASEAN statesmen who have actually made it happen, but one of the thing, reasons why that's been possible is that almost coincident with ASEAN's foundation was the emergence of this uncontested US primacy when Nixon went to China. And I don't think, as the old communists might have said, that's a coincidence, as a, you know. Um, so I don't think... Um, uh, I think I don't think ASEAN does function as a great power. I think now that now that that order is coming unpicked, we're going back to an era where the relationship between the stronger states becomes really central, and I think um, uh, that it's going to be very hard for ASEAN. It won't, I think ASEAN, as a whole and its members, should do what it can to influence the outcome. But I don't think it should. It, it, it won't be at the table. It'll be on the sidelines. Now, of course, there is a tough business there. I mean, it's, it's, it is tough to say, and, you know, Australia's part of this as well, that the great powers are going to sit together in a small room somewhere and decide the region's future, and we're going to be squeezed out. But we have a choice. We've got to decide whether we'd rather live in a region in which the great powers do their deals behind closed doors and we have to live with the consequences, or one in which the great powers don't do deals and we have to live with the consequences. Now, I know the old ASEAN line, if the elephants dance, make love, or the elephants fight, the ants still get squashed. Well, actually, I don't think that's true. They get squashed a lot flatter when they fight and when they make love. 
And, and this is, I don't want to pursue this metaphor too far. I, I, I spent a couple of months in Europe rather atypically, so I'm sort of been exploring European metaphors here, and a European interlocutor in a talk I gave in France said, but, but you know, really you're consigning ASEAN and Australia and the rest of them to the position of poor old Poland under the concert of Europe. Um, you know, Poland got taken apart in Vienna and, and, uh, and uh, Poland's aspirations for nationality were, were dashed, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate point. But you do have to ask, and this is a hard way of make, making it, this is not a nice business, but you have to ask yourself whether you'd rather have been Polish in the 19th century or Polish in the first three quarters of the 20th century. It's a line ball, but actually I'd much rather have been Polish in the 19th century for all of the tragedies of Poland's history than compared to what happened to it in the 20th century. And that's the kind of choice we face. So yeah, it's pretty tough to be locked out, but if the great powers can't find a way to get on, we're screwed. So I think, now, um, so why so much regional support for the pivot? Um, I think it's because we, and I say this, I use that collective pronoun deliberately, because it's true of Australia, we are not very good at this. We don't really understand what's going on. We, we, we do all want the United States to stay engaged. Um, and rightly so. Um, I don't think we cl clearly enough understand how much the pivot was predicated on the idea of contesting US, the, the US challenge. It's not that, I should say, it's not that the United States in playing the role I think the United States should play does not need to be militarily strong in Asia. I think it does. Uh, it goes to a broader argument which I won't unpack here about what actually would be involved in the US playing the role I'm thinking about. Um, uh, but I think uh, the Australian government, for example, just thought, isn't that nice um, that America's going to play a bigger role without asking, well, what does this actually mean about where the US-China's relationship's going? So I think we need to start being, all of us need to start being a bit more sophisticated about our, um, about our strategic thinking. Um, can't hear the great question of India. I mean, I, I'm, I absolutely agree with you, of course, I think. But let, but let me give a slightly different perspective. Talking to Americans, um, really from, you know, from a de decade ago almost, there was this, I, don't, you know, I have immense respect and affection for the US system, so I don't want to trivialise it, but there was a, a, t a, a very strong sense that India would be a card that America could play against China. That, uh, that India would decide that its objective was to support American objectives in, in Asia. In other words, that India would define its strategic uh, um, aims as its power grew as supporting America's role as the sole great power in Asia. And I spent a fair bit of time saying, oh, I've met some Indians. I, I can't think that's the way they see it. They see India's objective as being to develop India's role as a great power in Asia. And uh, I, think, um, I think the misunderstanding, or the, the, the too ready assumption that India would simply align its basic strategic objectives with America's led to a kind of romanticis romanticisation of what, was of what India was going to deliver. And the, and the view, a view I hear less now than I used to, when I said, oh, look how chi powerful China's getting, and America said, yeah, but we got India. And I said, no you, no, you haven't got India. India's got India. It's a very important part of the picture, but it's not... Is not going to support th that position. So I, I think India is a very important part of the of the balance. So one of the reasons why I'm sure China can't dominate Asia, and I hope the Chinese understand that. But I don't think it's going to help support U.S. U.S. primacy. I, I agree that, in a sense, the pivot ended up being a sign of weakness. It also goes to Evelyn's point. Um, I mean, it's worth making the point. I don't, I don't think that 250 trending upwards marines in Darwin was ever intended to have any significant operational effect. If it was, then it really is sh shockingly trivial. Uh, but I think it was very important. It had very significant diplomatic um, significance, and that is it was intended to demonstrate Australia's support for America's approach to China. And I think uh, 
Again, that was not a coincidence. I think there were people in Washington who wisely believed that, America, that Australia's support needed to be demonstrated because there were some flaky people down there. Um, and, and I mean, <laughs> just me, I mean, there's a, there's a, there is an interesting debate in Australia about uh, often ill-conceived and misrepresented. But, but, you know, Australians are very conscious of the fact that um, China is very important to our future. So I think, but, but I'd, I'd make a slightly a different point, and that is, I think what really demonstrates the weakness of America's military position in Asia is the air sea battle concept. Because, you know, it's always a good idea to drive these arguments to their conclusion. You know, in the end, what, what are the forces there to do? Well, we know. God bless them. They're there to fight the air sea battle. And what's the air sea battle? The air sea battle is an attempt to regain sea control for the United States so it can then again project power against China by sea. And, I, I, you know, every so often you come across an operational concept and you just look at it and say, that, that makes no sense at all. I mean, it's a big subject, but at three levels. The first is, I think it's very unlikely to work. That is, I think it's very unlikely the United States will, can significantly can erode China's sea denial capabilities far enough to make it a practical operational proposition to, to, to project power against China. The second is if it does work, it'll be, even if it doesn't work, it'll be massively escalatory. It guarantees that even a small war with China turns into a major conflict and it runs a very significant risk of pushing up against the nuclear threshold. And the third is, okay, assume it works. Assume it doesn't escalate. So America can again sail the aircraft carriers and the marine and amphibious forces up against the China coast and then unleashes the full force of, say, seven aircraft carrier battle groups and half of the Marine Corps against China. What does that do? This is China. I'm sorry, they're not going to march across Tiananmen Square this time. They did last time, at least 100 years ago, 110 years ago. They're not going to do that. The fact is the United States does not have the capacity, the military capacity, to have a decisive strategic effect on China without resort to nuclear weapons. It's not Iraq. It's much bigger, even though Iraq does raise interest. So I, I, I think as soon as you start looking at what the United States thinks it's doing, you realise that it's actually, the armed force is not going to be the solution to this problem. Um, lastly, though, just to, just, to, just to redress the balance, um, I've said I think there are huge asymmetric advantages to the United States in Asia, to China in Asia. I've got to say, I still think the United States has huge advantages in Latin America. If it comes to a competition, competition in Latin America, I think the Americans will win that one. But for exactly the same reason that I think the Chinese will win, will, will win or at least America can't win, a competition in Asia. Uh, and that is because in the end, not just American power close to home is so vast, it's still a very powerful country, but also do Americans really, really, really care what happens in the Western Hemisphere? Yep, President Munro said so and nothing's proved him wrong since then. And does China really, really care about it? Not that much. So all the arguments that make me pessimistic about Asia make me optimistic about Latin America, but that's not much consolation to us. Uh, you and Graham, Graham, RSIS, um, thank you, Hugh. Um, China, Japan. Yes. China, Japan has um, come back on the agenda with a, a vengeance. With a bang. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit more optimistic uh, than you are about um, China, US in isolation. And I think I mentioned Japan because I don't think it's a, it's a freestanding bipolar. Um, there isn't the luxury of that as we've seen, I think, with the um, tensions over the Senkaku and other, and other factors in recent uh, weeks and months. Um, why? Um, I think in structural terms, unlike the other potential members of the concert, it's easier, and I say this guardedly because I've got Japanese friends, but it's easier to make a convincing case that there is an uh, absolute decline as a, as a, yes. as a potential yes. fate for Japan, yes. which of course is far harder to manage than yes. it is yes. for the relative yes. rise or relative decline yes. of the United yes. States. Yes. Um, particularly when some of that space that China is going to occupy, probably by design, yes. will be most likely at Japan's expense, yes. economically, yes. Um, potentially even physically. So I, I, how is the United States, if it is to cede that space to China, to provide sufficient reassurance to Japan at the same time to prevent that, that um, China-Japan relationship from becoming independently destabilizing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, one more question and then can go. Okay. Um, sorry, it's a very short question. 
I'm Japanese, so I would like to uh, ask also Japan's question. Um, uh, you mentioned in 2008 that the um, uh, strategic affairs in Asia are uh, entering new and unfamiliar territory in which many of our old assumptions may prove invalid. In this new Asia, we may find that the least bad option is for Japan to become a nuclear power. So um, uh, concerning the uh, current situation where that the uh, China and Japan are confronting uh, over Senkaku Islands, uh, I think the uh, uh, your idea that the uh, Jap uh, Japan, uh, India, U.S., and China uh, should seek the concert of powers in Asia is very difficult for Japan to choose. So I'd like to ask you, well, uh, um, uh, how Japan should do to seek the concert of powers in, in Asia to prevent that the uh, Japan uh, to become a nuclear power in Asia? Thank you. Okay, two, two, two very good questions, just absolutely spot on. Every, every US-China story is really a US-China-Japan story. Um, and so you're absolutely right to make the sort of basic analytical point. And the, the only reason I leave it out of the analysis is because it makes it so hard to get the thing out in a civilised language. You end up giving a sort of a Castro-length speech on the subject. So let me give you a very condensed version of it. Um, I, I do think Japan is in a very difficult strategic position. I, I absolutely agree with you that you can make an argument for decline in relation to Japan more strongly than you can, much more strongly than you can in relation to the United States, if only on demographic grounds. O on the other hand, I still think Japan has um, the core attributes of a great power in the Asian system, at least for quite a few decades to come. Um, and it's not just because its economy, although it shrinks relatively, still remains pretty big, but it also has a lot of strategic advantages. It, it, the fact that it's an island rather than contiguous territorially with China makes a big difference, makes it much more defensible. Uh, the fact it's got a phenomenal technological base, an industrial base makes a huge difference. And the fact that it has a great strength of, shall we say, Japanese-ness, I think makes a real difference. Um, so it's tr a tricky one. There's a question as to whether the Japanese are in the end going to be able to do it, but I, my, my gut feeling is that they're going to, that, that they have the, the inherent capacity to remain a great power, by which I mean, I should say, a power which is strong enough that if it's dissatisfied with the order, it can, with the deal that the other great powers make, it can exercise a veto over it. If, if, the, if the US, China and Japan get together and agree something, and Australia decides they don't like it, they will say, Poof. oh, that's interesting. Uh, if, if the US and China get together and agree something and Japan doesn't like it, that's different. They've, they've got to pay attention to Japan. So I think Japan remains that strong. Um, I do think Japan is in an absolutely uh, terrible strategic dilemma. Uh, it genuinely worries about the rise of China for reasons I completely understand, and I think there's a real failing in Chinese policy. I don't think they take Japan seriously enough. They haven't worked to reassure Japan uh, for reasons I, again, understand. Um, as long as, the, as long as Japan continues to rely on the United States for security from China, which it does as a US client, then uh, Japan's sense of security will depend on its judgment as to whether or not the United States will always support Japan ahead of China. Always choose Tokyo rather than Beijing. And the stronger China gets, uh, the less confident Japan can be of that. And I think we've seen that at work uh, in some of the recent crises. And of course what happens is that every crisis becomes then a test of the US-Japan relationship. Japan becomes terribly sensitive to American failure to support Japan to the hilt. Um, and that is terribly dangerous because it means, for example, I mean, this is not a hypothetical issue, it means in relation to the Senkakus that if the US fails to support Japan over the Senkakus, if it goes pear-shaped, then there's real question about the durability of the US-Japan relationship. And it's worth bearing in mind that, that raises real questions about the credibility of the US posture in the Western Pacific. Because in a sense, US primacy in the Western Pacific is, you know, the US-Japan foundation is a big foundation of that. So actually the chance of the US and China going to war over something that Japan and China disagree about is actually quite high. Um, and what's worse, the more that the the Japanese get less and less confident that America will support them, the stronger and 
more formidable China becomes. And conversely, in order to be reassured that the United States will continue to support them, the Japanese actually hope the US-China relationship doesn't get that good. The more adversarial it is, the more comp the US-China are, the more confident they are that, J that, that the US will always support them against China. So Japan finds itself in the paradoxical position that it regards its security as depending on an adversarial relationship between the two most important countries in the world to it. This just can't work. What's worse, it encourages Japan to pull America away from a trusting relationship with China. For, and this is a difference, for example, between Australia and Japan. For, as far as Australia is concerned, the US and China can't be too close. As far as Japan's concerned, they're already too close. And that's a, that's a really fundamental difference of perspective. And it suggests that as long as Japan continues to depend on the United States for its security from China, the chances of a satisfactory US-China relationship are very low because Japan can, in effect, exercise a veto over it in Washington because, because, because Washington needs Japan. Um, and that suggests, and here is a classic example of where the logic of the argument takes you to a conclusion you don't want to go to, but you know where I'm gonna, what I'm going to say. That suggests that if a, a, a future stable Asia-Pacific order based on a stable US-China relationship depends on Japan no longer being a strategic client of the United States and emerging as an independent great power in its own right, which gets me to your question. I think Japan has to join the concept as a great power in its own right because I think if it continues to be a strategic client of the United States, the, 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 the necessary agreements between the US and China to get the whole thing going can't happen. And I think that means that Japan probably has to become a nuclear power. So here is a counterintuitive conclusion for you. That the stability in the Asia Pacific over the next few decades might be improved by Japan developing a minimum deterrent capability. Because if it doesn't, it will continue to depend on the United States and will poison the US-China relationship. And in fact, I think that is what's happening right now. I don't think this is a hypothetical speculation. Um, and that just tells you how different our world is going to be. Now, I, I, I do think, because I do think in the end Japan is a great power, and I also think that a Japan which does function independently as an independent great power would overall be a stabilising factor in the strategic balance. I, I think an Asia in which China... Japan, India, and the United States were all playing a strong role. I, I find that, even though I'm sorry not to be in the room with them, I find that quite a reassuring picture. I think Japan, from an Australian point of view, I think a strong Japan is, gonna, is, is, a, is a, functioning as a great power in that system is, 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 is going to be a good thing. I'd rather be in a system which Japan was playing that function, in which Japan left the room and became a little, you know, sort of a middle power outside the room with the rest of us. I'd rather you guys are in there. Um, but I think that this gonna, does mean, unless something, unless Gareth Evans gets his way, we, that, that means Japan is going to end up as a nuclear power. This is, of course, an immensely challenging question for Japan, and whether the J Japanese political system can, can do that, I don't know. And it's worth bearing in mind, I'm not predicting we're going to end up with this order. I think I'm not predicting that we're going to end up with a four-power concert like this. I think it's a long shot. I'm just saying that if we don't end up with that, we're going to end up with escalating strategic rivalry between the United States and China, and we're going to be living in a region which is much less agreeable than we hope it'll be. Okay, I guess we'll have to stop here, and uh, it's very, very enlightening. Please, again, join me. Give a big hand. Thank you.